Welcome back for another session of Haskell Love. Uh, this time we have with us uh, Martin. Martin Rizniczki. Uh, and he speaks uh, he speaks Kala Idris, and of course, our favorite Haskell. And uh, when I when I talked to him, I asked him a question. And it was about what's his favorite quote of all time, and what he told me was, I would say surprising, but in a good way. Uh, he said, "The dark side of the types is a pathway to many abilities some consider to be unnatural." I know that a Jedi cannot, should refrain from things such as love, but since I, I can't help loving Haskell, I decided I should join him. Now, I don't want you to get me wrong, but um, That's this is not about ruling the world. With, this is not about ruling the world. It's about uh, using types to write better, co better code and spread the love. So let's see how we can do that with Marcin. Marcin? <laughs> Thank you. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a really, uh, a really great uh, introduction. Um, okay, so uh, welcome everyone to my talk, which is called Building a uh, Web Library Using Super Hard Haskell. Now, this, this title is a little joke of Chris Vogt's talk that's scheduled for tomorrow. Uh, you know, when he announced his talk, uh, it's titled uh, Building game engineering as something with super simple Haskell. So I thought, well, I might jokingly call my talk building something using super hard Haskell, uh, hence the title. But while it's a joke, um, there is an important point I want to make, uh, which is don't be afraid of hard Haskell as it's actually not so hard. It's, uh, I think it's pretty easy. But w what the actually so-called hard Haskell is. Um, I'll talk about that in a, in a second, but first um, a few words about me. So you see, I'd been a, I'd been a Scala programmer for the past few years. Um, you know, I was, a, I was a speaker at a few conferences, uh, had a maybe not so bad blog. Uh, and now you may call me a, um, a disillusioned Scala programmer. Um, I quit my last Scala job uh, in January and I've been only investing in Haskell since then. If you open my LinkedIn or something, you'll notice that, uh, that I have a lot of experience. I've been in the trenches since I know, almost the beginning of the century. Uh, but I, I don't, think that's a, uh, don't think this is a metric that counts. Uh, as Oscar Wilde famously said, experience is the name everyone gives to their mistakes. Uh, so my Haskell experience consists of uh, two lips on stackage. <laughs> right now, so more is coming. Okay, I am going back to the, uh, to the topic of the talk. Uh, okay, so what is hard Haskell? Well, it must be the opposite of uh, simple Haskell, naturally. And I think you all heard of the, um, of the simple Haskell initiative that uh, gained a lot, of, a lot of traction recently. Uh, they even have uh, badges, simple Haskell badges. I think that there should be also a hard Haskell badges. Uh, nice. Um, but what is, uh, what is simple Haskell then? So uh, even looking at their webpage, they actually notice that it's, uh, it's really in the eye of the beholder. Uh, they wrote something like, there are as many opinions of what constitutes simple Haskell as there are people who have, uh, who have them. But I think they tend to agree but basically that Haskell 98 is the simple Haskell. Uh, so uh, as a corollary, hard Haskell must consist of the things beyond you know, pure functions, you know, summon product types, type classes, polymorphism, um, which is these, right? GDT is higher rank polymorphism, generics, uh, type applications, and so on and so forth. And um, the simple Haskell promises a list of benefits for those who stay away from such things. And they say maturity, uh, they say no leaking complexity, uh, quote, uh, fancy Haskell is costly to teams, unquote, or complexity will spread. And you know, the trouble I'm having here is that 
you can only go so far with you know, functions and data. Of course, there are a lot of things you can do, but also a lot of things you can't. And these things that are off limit, according to simple Haskell, tend to crop up very often, I think. Um, there's this book I'll advertise in a second. Uh, it has this motto, uh, when people say that most business logic bugs aren't type errors, I just want to show them how to make bugs into type errors. Uh, ironically, Matt Parsons uh, said that, and he's one of the, I said ironically, because he's one of the proponents of simple Haskell, I believe. And the trouble is you need a lot of this hard Haskell to do that effectively. Because a lot of business logic is about interactions between terms, uh, which is the world of runtime values, and the static knowledge you possess. These things, they tend to manifest themselves, uh, themselves as a mixture of hard things. GEDTs, phantom types, transformations and types, this kind of quasi-dependent type flavor. Also, uh, they eliminate FFI. No FFI means that everything needs to be written in Haskell. Why? Well, no one wants to program in C, I get that. But uh, there, are, there are battle tested solutions, right? And FFI is actually flawless in Haskell. But of course, why would anyone bother if hard Haskell were that hard and viral? But is it? Um, when, when I was starting to learn Haskell, I bought myself this book, which I can sincerely recommend to every Haskell programmer, even an aspiring Haskell programmer. Um, as you can see, I, I bought a hardcover copy and that's, um, uh, that's something because it's not easy to buy a, a hardcover copy. I even made a, it's not a professional photo, if you notice. Uh, I just snapped this picture myself, so you can call me a fanboy. Uh, but when I first read it, I was, astonished how how clear type level programming is in Haskell. And I, I didn't know much about Haskell back then. Well, I still don't, but you know, less than. And as you remember, I used to be a Scala programmer. Uh, maybe that's what uh, shaped my experience. Because you can do, uh, you can do most of uh, these fancy things or even all of them in Scala, but they always seem to hang by a thread. Uh, I, even, um, I even made an example showing a, a, a typical age list implementation in both languages. So, you know, it's, it's not only nine lines versus three, okay? It's, it's the amount of deciphering, grasping all the symbols, you know, artwork you have to put in Scala. What's this, what's this uh, plus, okay? What's the uh, smiley here? between T and H list. So it's, it's not that Scala is not expressive, but the encoding it's, uh, is, is not really elegant. It's, it's, it's nasty, I would say. And in Haskell, this is really fantastic, I thought. Uh, so what, what this book showed me is that Haskell is an excellent language for this kind of stuff. And you can imagine my surprise when I found out that people were complaining. Uh, also, Every piece works beautifully in Haskell, contrary to Scala, where things, as you've seen, are not really intuitive, but also, you know, uh, for instance, type inference, you know, it always stops working when you actually need it, and you know, so on and so forth. Um, so what I want to show you today is, um, is how to use things that can be thought of according to this made-up definition as fancy Haskell, but are, in my opinion, quite easy. Um, okay, so what I was trying to do was uh, was some JSON web token decoding in Haskell. For those of you that don't know, um, JSON web token is a standard of, of safely exchanging encoded messages in, in forms of tokens. Um, these tokens contain a signature, uh, so it is safe to, to send them on the net, for instance. Um, they're often used as, um, as kind of cookies, keeping information, for instance, about the login user, right? And under the hood, they are just, um, they're just JSON objects. Now I'll try to okay, do some drawing here. So um, you have a header. I'm not sure if that's visible. Um, oh, let me 
anyways. Um, so you have a header here and, uh, and a payload. And header is, a, is just a few fixed fields, right? Um, payload is, is data. It can be anything, but there are a few standardized fields like sub or IAT, meaning subject and issued add. And they're called registered claims. Uh, so there, there are standardized fields. And all the other fields in the payload are called unregistered claims, like the name here, right? So it's anything you can, you can imagine. You can put there anything. So it's fairly simple, right? And there, uh, there are two Haskell libraries currently listed on JWTIO, and both of them, uh, both of them represent a fixed part in a straightforward manner, right? As, uh, as you could imagine, as a, as a record that you've made of new types. That's yeah, that's okay. That's very natural, right? As a typical representation of header and fixed part of payload. But but both of them, I think, fail miserably to represent this, uh, this unregistered, unstructured part, right? Alas, this is the typical representation of variable parts, a map of text to value. So why, why is map like this bad? Well, first of all, it, it is it's a hard dependency on ASIN, right? The value there is, is an ASIN data type. I have to know ASIN even though I have no intention of using it for anything. Right? It's also a wrong abstraction. So because of, why do I have to deal with JSON out of the sudden? But more importantly, um, in cases like this, as I said earlier, and these things crop up very often in, uh, in a wide amount of business problems, you usually don't exchange anything to anything, right? It's for transferring the state of your web application or between web applications. So you know what is in there. You put it there yourself. Or there is a schema that, that you know, both parties have agreed to. So there is an amount of static knowledge, what keys are, what are, uh, what are the types, that you're not utilizing, you're ignoring it totally. And also, I, I have to write the code to decode it and deal with the possible errors. Uh, you know, the best code is the code that doesn't get written. And also, let me add, um, the most performant code is the code that's not executed during runtime. So I think this is, uh, I think this is so far the simple Haskell can get you. It's definitely a simple interface, but working with it is not simple at all. Um, if you know the um, famous worse is better uh, article, um, then, then I think it's, it's, it's the example of worse is better. So worse is better says that implementation must be easy to implement, but needs not be uh, entirely correct or easy to use. So it, it, it's better for implementation to be easy on the implementer rather than on the user. I think we, we see an example of it, of it here. Okay, so let's let's uh, let's design a solution. Um, the solution would be as follows: I say um, you need something more expressive to uh, to utilize the static knowledge you have. You might call it type level hackery. Also, uh, I'd like to call C to perform computationally complex tasks like crypto stuff. I trust C libraries to do that well. So let's have fun. And um, I want to eliminate those low level details. I want a lot of things to be derived off the types. And if you stick to simple Haskell, uh, to simple Haskell principles, uh, then the correct solution is out of limits. So you either need to step out of it or admit that it's not worth it. And in this example, um, it very well might be, you might say, because um, it's it's simple and people have been using you know map text to, of text to value for ages, right? But keep in mind that you are going to encounter tons of very similar pro problems. I can count how many times I've encountered problems like this in my career. But okay, you don't have to trust me. So I, I browsed Reddit um, to see what people are uh, what what type level programming is used for, and 
you know, there, there were a long list of answers, configuration, roads in servant, um, deriving documentation, you know, like, like Swagger or something like that, out of uh, expressive types, communication protocols, uh, authorization, embedding DSLs, or well, Vulkan uh, tends to be, a, tends to benefit from it because it's, it's I guess, uh, quite complex embedding. Deriving correct serializers, uh, financial contracts, uh, where you know where correctness is is, is paramount uh, was listed very often. Um, well, uh, even from today's talks, uh, when I saw uh, the first talk of of, um, of this day by Alejandro Serrano, well, the GraphQL was not not simple Haskell. Right? So, at the very least, it's wise to know how to approach these problems, and of course, understand the. Uh, the power to benefit ratio. And you totally don't have to use all the terrifying libraries with no docs. The solution you, uh, you design for your program does not have to be absolutely generic, okay? It has to work only with your domain. So you can stop short of using things you don't need. Okay, uh, let's start with all level stuff. Now, you shouldn't be afraid of FFI. It's seamless in Haskell. Uh, I think that the real world Haskell, uh, the famous book, contains the best reference. It's, uh, it's free online. Um, okay, so you just, you just start with, uh, with adding libraries. I hope I can draw something. I'm drawing white. Hmm. Okay, so I'll just circle. So you start with adding libraries to your Kabul file like this, and GHC will simply link it. Linking can be hard, but if you keep things simple, then it's simple. So you just link it like this, and it's time to add some bindings. Um, you know, bindings are basically Haskell functions uh, using special marshallable types. They can return the result embedded in I.O. if you want to signal its, um, its side effecting nature to the compiler. For instance, that it allocates or modifies memory or I don't know, sets a system date. In other words, if a function can uh, return different results, even when given the same arguments, or you know that it changes the outside world in an observable way, you mark it as returning IO. And GHC marshals that automatically. Otherwise, the compiler has no way of knowing that such things happen and may, for instance, I know, optimize your function away. Okay, uh, you can use uh, foreign pointers just fine. Uh, if, sorry, function pointers just fine. And you can also use foreign pointer as a um, kind of auto pointer for automatic memory, memory, man, memory management. Sorry. So even though it is C, you don't have to manage memory in an error prone and manual way. Um, there's, a, there's a tooling uh, for creating Haskell, uh, for creating Haskell wrappers of C constants like enums here. Um, you can add kind of header files that are processed by, uh, by HSC to HS tool. It's, for, it's fired automatically by couple or stack and it generates type safe bindings. Um, okay, but sometimes you'll unfortunately have to write a bit of C yourself. Uh, let's take a look at this situation. Uh, even though this is the correct mapping and both is both these functions exist, you'll get linker errors, um, even when you use them as is. And you'll get these er errors uh, fairly late when building tests, for instance, or executables. Why? Because one is a, a C macro and the other has a static linkage. Um, so you have to watch out for these things. Uh, so you have to watch out for these things. The only way I know how to make it work is to write uh, C wrappers yourself and compile them with your program like this. Uh, so it can get a um, it can get a little complicated depending on the foreign code you target. Uh, for instance, exchanging structures you have to deal with storable type class. Um, variadic arguments like print are not directly supported. So some signatures can be harder to translate or you'll have to write wrappers yourself as in this example, but all in all, it's just as, uh, it's just as simple Haskell would have it. It's new types and 
and data. Um, so with these bindings in place, uh, you can write an, a simple glue modules for low level stuff. Basically a simple imperative-ish code you'd write in C. Haskell is the world's finest imperative language, as someone once said. Was it, uh, was it Simon, uh, Simon, Peyton Jones? So here it is. Uh, it's, it's basically what you would write in C, yet with better types. You can use strings or C strings, all the types of ints, um, pointers, um, byte strings have low level interface too, but all these wrapped in Haskell. Oh, and as you probably have noticed, um, this code is in dashed uh, frame. It's a reference to the book I wrote, uh, I read, sorry, I wish I would, um, The Little Typer, uh, where they marked code that's not entirely correct as um, in, in, in dashed frames. So that's what I'm doing here. So this code is not entirely correct. Why? Well, it's, it's okay, but um, you can do even better by wrapping, by, by wrapping it in a, in a custom IO type. The main reason for this is that now you are sure uh, now you're sure when you see an expression of the type that it contains only calls to Jensen or JWT, no print lines, no reading files. So as you can see, uh, using C libraries is not really much effort. Uh, furthermore, uh, there are interesting optimization techniques that you can pull off. So if you take a look at the um, at the highlighted places. So we have to marshal from Haskell strings, which is a list of characters to valid C strings, uh, which are continuous memory chunks. And this involves copying memory around. But we know that we'll be dealing with mostly constants or type level literals later on, uh, which are also constants. And GHC optimizer is very powerful. So even if we later on wrap this in into more complex expressions, it will still be able to recognize that we started with a constant string. So there is an incredibly effective optimization that we can use to avoid copying, precisely because we do not operate on a text to value type or interface anymore. And this is called the rules pragma. So we need to write the unsafe version, so to say, that can only work with an already valid C pointer. That's, the, that's it. And then you can enjoy no excessive memory copying because when GHC will know that one of these functions is given a string literal, and that's the part here, it's shamelessly copied of, uh, from byte string library, then it will rewrite the function to use the row pointer, to use the row pointer version, thus avoiding copying. And this is one of the examples where um, we're translating the domain knowledge, which is that we'll be using mostly constant strings as keys to, to more specific types can speed up your program. One more benefit. Um, sometimes you need to guide it and add inline pragma here and there. So output from these options is uh, from, yeah, I'm using gdump simple stats. Uh, so output from this is indispensable when dealing with rewrite rules. But yeah, we have a very powerful uh, and uh, effective optimization technique. Um, so with that in place, I think we've built a strong foundations and performant foundations uh, that we can build on. We do not want to expose it to the users directly. We need to create a bridge between low level stuff and high level stuff between the C representation and Haskell. So let's wrap it first into really simple type classes like claim and coder here. Uh, it's still low level as it exposes the pointer to uh, to a C code, but it's uh, it's clear from the signatures that this can only side effect, right? But thanks to our little new type, we know that no one's gonna implement this with put string lines. Right? These are only close to our libraries. And so for simple types that are understood by the FFI backbone, we just call into C. And um, adding new types is easy as, as uh, these encoders are contravariant functors. This isn't necessarily the best design. There, are, there, is, an, uh, there is an other 
in my opinion, better design that involves type families and is easier to extend, but if time allows. Okay, so we can encode Haskell values as long as we can recursively map them to values that we know how to encode. And as the base, we have what we, uh, what we know how to encode in C, which we expose through FFI. For more complex structures, we can tag our simple encoders in our custom IO, which we call uh, JWTIO. So if you remember the slide explaining the web token structure, we can encode the fixed parts. We've just created new types for each fixed part. Um, I think we have a question. Okay. Um, okay, so um, the question is, uh, isn't GHC using some UTF-8 dish encoding for string constants? I guess you'd have to watch out to, to only use ASCII strings. Um, yeah, you, you need to use Haskell strings if I, if I understand the question correctly. As uh, GHC can compile them, if they are constant, then GHC will compile them to uh, pointers to arrays as you would like it, uh, as you would have it in C. Uh, so you need to use that, but uh, you'll use that only for keys which are short strings like, I don't know, name, user ID, is admin, so I don't think it's a, uh, it's not something you do text for, text data type for, I guess. Uh, did, I understand, did I answer the question? <laughs> um, so. I'm not sure, no. Yeah, <laughs> hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, we can talk about the laser during Q&A, uh, but yeah I, yeah, I hope I did. And, okay, thank all you. Right, so, um, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so we've just created new types for each fixed part, like issuer, subject, uh, audience, and so on. These are the uh, standardized fields. And since we already know the names of our claims, the compiler can perform the optimization I was talking about and avoid copying it when calling C, because this sub here after compilation is, as I said, already a pointer to a character array. And the code is uh, in, in, uh, in the dashed frame because we haven't figured out yet the most interesting part, which is the encoding of the variable part. But first there is a, there is a glaring gap that you have probably already noticed. So we have to somehow escape our JWTIO. And the thing that stands out here is the use of unsafe perform IO. It's a rather infamous and uh, ominous function which comes with a big red warning. Uh, so uh, why are we so confident to use it? Why does this function exist at all? Well, if you remember, values of this type can, by construction, contain only FFI calls to our libraries, Jensen or JWT. There's no other way to create them. So, um, oops, sorry. So, um, we know that whatever is going on in JWTIO is pure. The, I mean, the only side effects it will perform are local, like allocating memory. And those effects won't escape the code. And that's why unsafe perform IO exists precisely to enable Haskell to call C. And that's what we're going to use. And so with that out of the way, we can finally venture into the realm of fanciness. Okay, um, let's start with this private claims. It's, uh, it's parameterized by the precise type of what it contains. This is just an untyped map. The premise is that we can recover from this type all the information needed from this type, all the information needed to safely access this map. In other words, it needs to mimic map, but on the type level. So it needs to be a list of pairs of string plus type of value boxed into any. So on the type level, we should really say a type of kind of list of types of kind of pair of symbols or type level literals, 
and types. See what I did there? Where on the, um, on the regular Haskell level, I was using the word type, I promoted it to something I'm calling now kind. And where I was using the word value, I promoted it to type. And these are the, bas the basics of Haskell kind system and data type promotion, which we'll have to understand more to see what's going on. Okay, so let's imagine that type system is a very simple, very modest programming language on its own. Okay, and in this language, values are Haskell types and types are kinds. So let's star here, also called type with capital T, be a type of Haskell type. So where Haskell has a five as a value and in as a type, type language has int as a value and star as a type. So for instance, either can be thought of as an equivalent of function in this type level programming language that takes two types and uh, produces a third one. So we call it a type constructor as opposed to data constructor like, I don't know, like write. Unfortunately, there is one problem with this, uh, with this language. It's that it's uh, untyped, it's, it's Python. The kind system, the, you know, the, the uh, Haskell's rich type system, uh, the Haskell has a rich type system and this, type, this kind system has too few kinds. It's just star or functions of, of star and so on, type constructors. And the remedy is, um, is the data kinds extension, which can extend Haskell's kind system with new kinds, just as a uh, Haskell type system can be extended with new types. It works via a data type promotion. So a data type becomes a new kind and its constructors become new types of this kind. So see how in this example, uh, we create a data type pair which can be promoted to, rep uh, to represent a pair of types now. Now we can create a list of a uh, pair of types, which is of type of kind list of pairs. What's important is that information is, uh, is about each of the types is retained in this list. Just as if you had a list of ints, which as you know, keeps each int value and allows you to access it. And going further with this correspondence, uh, if you try to insert, um, say, integer to a list of pairs, it would not work. And the same at the type level, you cannot add a type int to a list of pair of types. Because int has kind star and pair of types is kind, well, pair. So it's no longer Python. And I hope this gives you um, this gives you an idea how we can implement type level map. Oh, the only thing missing seems to be how to encode strings. And fortunately, GHC already does that for us, promoting type string to the kind called symbol. And each literal, like A, B, C, D, E, F, to singleton type of this kind. Uh, by the way, I'm not sure if I mentioned the tick symbol. Uh, it's, uh, it's very simple. It's just to disambiguate between value level and type level. So when needed, you use tick. For instance, without tick, mcapair would be a regular, uh, regular, uh, regular sorry, data constructor with tick. It's a type constructor. Okay, so making progress. Um, we already know how to encode information on type level, and I hope this still stays, uh, stays very simple. Now, information about claims can be encoded, as we saw, as a kind of list of pairs, symbol, which is a GHC speak, uh, GHC speak for type level literal, to a, a regular type. And with the help of the funny operator here, we can write it out quite naturally. Now we will have to, so to say, synchronize value level, that's the hash map part, with type level, so that the former is precisely described by the letter. In other words, if the type level list contains a pair, then and only then the correspondingly type pair is in the hash map. 
to do that, we'll have to make, uh, we'll have to definitely make use of the structure of our types, which we can see here. You can observe this, uh, like name is already retained in the list and the structure of this type is, we, we see it, right? We know it. So we need something like, like pattern matching as an addition to our type level language. And this is the role of type families and they are, they are very natural as you see or maybe already know. I won't even explain them. I think just seeing them is gonna be enough for complete understanding. But first a teaser, uh, a teaser is how can you create a value of type what we just created? Thinking, thinking, well, you can't. Uh, well, one answer might be, one reason might be that because there is no value of symbol. It exists only at the type, on the type level. So data kinds can only create um, uninhabited types. Unlike in say Idris, which is a fully fledged dependent type language. In Haskell, the world of types and kinds and the world, uh, types and kinds in the world of values, they coexist, but they are not entirely one and same. So we need a way to talk about uh, claims at the term level, to provide those values to be stored in, uh, in the map. One way to do it, as uh, I'm just to create a data type for it. Uh, please notice how it's just the same syntax for the function constructing this, this term level, uh, these value representations, these witnesses, as for the type describing claims. This is to, to help understand the connection between them. So now we can create values carrying any type described by their name, described by their name as part of, as a part of their type. Here. Um, there is this nice GHC extension called overloaded labels. Uh, this basically enables a nicer syntax for dealing with type level literals, which is what I used here. Um, this is for this syntax, hash. You can disregard it entirely and just look at the last lines of the example, that's, uh, that's the same. Uh, it achieves exactly the same effect. Okay, now we're ready to finally do something with our data type. So um, having defined these, we can add things to our map. Not only as you can see uh, the names here of keys are retained in the type, but also we guarantee that if the pair, say user ID int is in the type, then the key user ID is in the map associated with an int value. Okay, but why is this code in a, in a dashed frame? Uh, because this code has a bug, or actually two. First of all, we are not disallowing adding the same key twice. And more importantly, we can add name of something that's already registered claim, like subject or issuer, right? So this is where the type level fancy stuff shines. We can easily turn these runtime, you would say, errors into compilation errors. Enter finally type families. Okay, so, um, you know, it, it might seem that there is a lot going on, but just, just look at it. Who doesn't understand what's going on? It's like the simplest, entry level code. It does operate on types, but isn't it, isn't it self-explanatory? So uh, write junior code. That's what uh, simple Haskell has in slogan. So yeah, I agree, write junior code, but on the type level, and here it is. And who said the type errors need to be obscure? Okay, so this is again, uh, completely junior level code, but this time it has some twists which maybe uh, require an explanation. So um, constraint is a kind of things that can be on the left hand side of, of the arrow, the context basically. Uh, so this way we can not only compute regular types, but also contexts. And we can group them like this. So this says to be able to add, all these things are, all these things actually are, 
required. This is the uh, trivial context. It's always met. So if the name is unique, there is nothing more to be done here. But um, if the name is not unique, type error. Well, you can think of it as a context that always fails, but it fails with the specified message, which finally gives us, yeah, so you can have nice error messages too. And of course you can implement uh, in theory all the logic you want, almost. Uh, for instance, you can insist that strings are URIs or I don't know, uh, check if they start with a capital letter. The only thing required is that you know them statically. All right, I think we're short on time, so let me go quickly to the rest. So uh, many things are similar to implement and follow the same pattern. For instance, looking up value, which compiles if you can prove that the key is present. So here we have a couple of twists. Uh, this is the same thing we have written for insertion. It's transforming computation to a constraint plus some nice error messages. Again, junior level code on the type level. Uh, here, oh, we have to look at the exact type. So here is where we finally got rid of um, text to value. Oh, and the most interesting part. Uh, so how do we retrieve the value from existential? Its type has been forgotten. That's what existential is. So again, we use a very scary function, unsafe coerce. And this function's type is A to B or any A to B. So of course, such function cannot exist under a well-behaved uh, type system. So this is basically cheating. And it's of course, very dangerous cheating because if you get it wrong, then no warning shot, segfault. But well, my programs do not segfault, so it must work and it does. Um, because we know precisely what we expect, thanks to the precise type. So with this, we can enjoy, finally, a functional equivalent of map of text to value. Uh, but I promised how to, uh, to show you how to, uh, how to use it, to encode and decode a value in a type safe way. So let's, uh, let's get to it really quick. Um, okay, um, so yeah, so this is the final version of our encoding scheme. Decoding is somewhat more involved, but of course, uh, easily doable. Uh, let me just redirect you to the library once I release it, uh, probably in the upcoming two weeks. It will have even more nice tricks, but with, I hope, a uh, large degree of, of user friendliness. All right, um, the only problem is to write the actual instances, but thanks to rich kinds, we have already seen that we are aware of the structure of our types we can deconstruct them effectively. We have seen the example, so it suffices to perform a short inductive uh, reasoning. Can we encode empty set? Yes, we can. Uh, can we encode a set of n plus one elements given an encoding of n elements? Yes, we can. That's, uh, um, this get head and get tail here, uh, they are the simple eliminators. And interestingly, get tail is a zero cost function. Also, the rules pragma that we wrote uh, kicks in here. The writer is smart enough to know the claim names are constant strings, so it still means zero, zero overhead calling C. All right, um, that's more or less it. A short teaser, so things um, that are cool, um, and maybe I don't have time to mention them uh, in depth. Okay, uh, better ergonomics. Uh, so, you know, uh, working with, with this map can be more um, joyful if we eliminated the ceremonies behind constructing these values and so on. That's, that means less burden on users' code. That means users don't turn away. And you'd be surprised by how often these little things, uh, little things like these, cause users to reach for something else. Maybe that's why uh, type level programming has the reputation of being hard. But thankfully there is an alternative. Uh, so for instance, users can summon precisely typed claims from tuples or even arbitrary records. Like here, here's a tuple, here is the arbitrary records. The arbi uh, an arbitrary record actually, or the arbitrary record. Um, okay, so um, how to do that? Well, um, using type classes. 
um, creating smart converters, which are type classes. So this part here is a type family. It's also a type family. It's called the associated type family. It's open. It can be extended as opposed to, for instance, a unique name we saw, uh, which is closed, uh, which means that users can add new equations. In fact, every instance of this type class, uh, two private claims, defines a new equation. And the key property is that we can compute on the fly, so to say, the type of type level map representation. So for uh, one element tuple, two elements tuples, and so on and so on. And this behavior is indispensable and pretty powerful when we mix it with generics. We can create a type level map out of records. And now, um, I'm not sure if I have time to explain the algorithm. We use basically um, step to metadata. Here is the part that sees when sees a product type, it concatenates type lists of corresponding left or right hand side, left and right hand side representations. So this is a top down algorithm. Um, notice how we use another junior level code on the type level via type families. So that's how we concatenate type lists. Okay, generics may seem a bit impenetrable, but um, there is a clear scheme of working with them. The key ingredient is, uh, is to look at the uh, representation of types you're interested in, uh, for instance, in GHCI. I, I show an example in a second. Um, the second slide, uh, this slide contains a workhorse of this scheme. Uh, so see how we recover information from a single field, a single record field, keeping types and values in sync. Oh, with sync, I should say. Um, and yeah, the, 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 this, these little maps will get concatenated in the, uh, in the instance handling arbitrary products. Uh, of course, um, we specify as a constraint that we are only interested in named fields. And we explained that clearly in the error message, I hope. So when we encounter something we don't expect, which is the field, uh, a field without name, we fail with a classy error message, explaining the reason and even you know, giving, uh, giving an example of what's wrong. I think this is the key to successful fancy programming, clear error messages. Without it, the users will complain about impenetrable messages, and rightly so. Um, so yeah, don't forget about nice error messages. It's a good practice to handle the cases you don't know how to deal with via custom uh, type errors. Why? Because if you don't do that, you'll see this plus 15, 15 more lines of things people won't understand. And with it, you'll see a nice error message. Um, okay, I think we're out of Time. Oh yeah, um, I promised to show you a cheat sheet to generics. Uh, here it is. Just expand the representation of the type you want to handle and code to this. Okay, I think that's more or less it. Thank you very much. If you're interested in that kind of uh, programming, I'll put that as a library on Hackett soon. Um, yeah, here's my data. I don't use Twitter or Facebook. Uh, and I'm looking for a Haskell job. So if anyone uh, like what they saw, if there's someone who liked what they saw, then uh, you can contact me. Thank you very much.